Hello and welcome to this reflection on the project Exploring Embodied Approaches to Performing Experimental Music. Um, first, we'll introduce ourselves as researchers and participants in the project. Um, so uh, first, Simon. I'm Simon Fox. I am a postgraduate research student at Goldsmiths in Music and my interest is, I have my main interest in interdisciplinary creative practice. Hi, I'm uh, Mira Benjamin. I'm lecturer in performance at Goldsmiths, um, and I was involved in this project uh, to deliver one of the workshops, the topic of which was um, embodied approaches to uh, intonation, tuning practice, and microtonality. These are some of my research interests, along with epistemologies of practice. And I'm Pete Furness. I'm also a lecturer in performance at Goldsmiths, um, and I also co-led a workshop which focused on embodied approaches to working with technology with the voice and instruments uh, in combination. And uh, that ties in with my research uh, interests, which are in augmented instruments, instrumentality, and um, yeah, um, what, what the instrumentalist is in a 21st century practice. And uh, my name is Lauren Redhead. Uh, I also work at Goldsmiths. I uh, research um, broadly areas of creativity in uh, composition, in experimental music performance, and I also write about the aesthetics of music. And um, in this project, I have been uh, organizing and facilitating the workshops, and um, I delivered the introduction on thinking about methodology within uh, creative practice research in music performance. So uh, if we can move on to the introduction. So uh, this was a project that took place um, in uh, autumn of 2019 and uh, the beginning of 2020. And you can probably tell from the date that it was cut short for reasons related to the pandemic. Nevertheless, uh, we did hold a series of workshops before that happened, uh, in which we were able to think about a number of different facets of performance and performance practice and how we experience those. Um, so those were led by Pete and Mira and by their guests. And uh, as we've already heard, they included aspects of um, tuning, intonation and technology alongside uh, broader aspects of performance. With the participants in these workshops, we wanted to focus on not how we could realize specific pieces or specific musical ideas, but rather thinking about what it means to perform as individuals and what observations uh, we come across as a result of performing. So thinking about how perhaps work in progress or the practice of doing rather than of making an end product can uh, lead to research observations. Um, and uh, there are about 20 uh, participants who took part uh, in the two workshops. Uh, so we were able to hear reflections from a number of uh, researchers and students who took part in these uh, projects. Can we do the next slide, please? So the rationale for our method was not only about how we can think about performance, but also how we can draw on ways of thinking about group observation that come from uh, other disciplines. So in particular, the idea of collaborative event ethnography, uh, which is a way of thinking about how a group of people can observe a whole event uh, when it's not possible for a single person to do so. And of course, that has a parallel with practice research and particularly performance that takes place uh, with ensembles or larger groups or more than one individual, uh, because, of course, listening and performance are all parts of those experiences. Um, however, a single person does not experience all of those listening and performance moments. And so by working as a group, we were able to combine uh, multiple observations. And we also drew on the idea of uh, performance um, autoethnography. So the idea that by performing, we can uh, sort of write or notate or transcribe our experiences, as well as only having those experiences through performance. So we uh, worked with quite a varied group of uh, researchers and students who are at different stages in the educational performance research journeys. And we also um, thought about how the different sort of starting points that we brought to the workshops could help us to um, come across different observations and think about things in different ways. 
the people who took part in the workshops um, obviously shared their observations through their performances, but they also shared their reflections in writing after the workshops as well. So the purpose of this presentation is to share some of our reflections, but there are some that we can begin the discussion with. Um, the first was that we, we already observed a number of moments of insight in the workshops themselves. So seeing people try new techniques or do something for the first time or give um, suggestions for how we could develop and change what we were doing based on their experience of doing it in the workshop helped us already to kind of focus our ideas towards those moments of insight. However, we also found that this was difficult for people to externalize in terms of speaking or writing. So although we invited people to write about their observations, we uh, found that what people wrote wasn't necessarily about their experience of performing or what they heard or felt or listened to, um, but often they wrote things uh, like how much they enjoyed doing it or um, they wrote thanks for um, organizing it. So they, they wrote more of a review of what took place than uh, really an, uh, a reflection on what they experienced. We also found that um, it took a while to engage people in the method in terms of them uh, spontaneously leading, performing, providing their ideas. And often they look to us as facilitators to lead them, uh, which again perhaps shows that they're more used to working in that way. And so there was a barrier to break down in terms of inviting them to think about uh, performing and doing as a way of reflecting as opposed to um, only uh, kind of following instructions. And we also found that even though we uh, timetabled quite a large period of time for each of the, the workshops, the time passed very quickly. And uh, we felt that more sessions and more time as a group would help people to become more familiar and also to gain more experiences. Obviously, this is something that we weren't able to pursue uh, owing to the pandemic, but it's certainly something that uh, we can consider in the future. So I'm now going to invite everybody else to um, provide their um, reflections. And we're going to do this uh, in the form of three questions. Um, so the first question is about our individual experiences of taking part. And uh, I will invite Simon to speak first. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm come to this really, when I mentioned from an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary background, from the fact that I started as a social scientist. And so notions about ethnography, I'm quite used to. I also, when I work most of the time, have a strong autoethnographic strand in what I do. So this sort of fits rather nicely with what we're, we, were, we were trying to do here. I also found, and I suppose this is my a common experience for me, that my, my first experience of all of this in this, in this programme was fear. Because coming to uh, something like this as someone who, whose background isn't in music and coming to something which is designed to be welcoming for people who aren't, as it were, virtuosos in music, um, is quite a scary process. And I did find that that scariness really was perpetuated throughout the whole thing. Um, and, and that's no, by no means a bad thing to happen. And I've learned uh, during the time when I've been doing my research and been involved in a number of practices that fear is a great uh, um, friend to creativity. So although I, I have some experiences as fear, I also know, as it were, that it's doing me good. And I had very much had that feeling while I was doing this. Um, there's also this sort of element that, uh, as the participant, that uh, even though I felt that I, as it were, didn't belong because of my background and my training, um, I, I certainly didn't feel like that. I wasn't made to feel like that by the people who were taking part in it. I guess, though, that one of the ways in which it is counterproductive is that it sort of almost stopped me from, from reflecting as I might have done if I had been in, involved in a piece of performance myself, when I feel I'm quite good at going back and reflecting on what I've done, uh, looking at implications and learning from that, some sort of reflective cycle. I did find that more difficult while I was there because if you like, so, although fear uh, generates um, some sort of creative thought and, and, and I think interesting experiences in terms of performance, it also sort of seems to put a break on, on reflection whilst you're doing it. 
because the, the overwhelming fear feeling is about fear. Um, however, having said that, that's the only thing I could think of. I mean, I did really enjoy uh, doing things like le le leaning on a, a very expensive piano and playing it. I mean, I'm, uh, the, the thing about this, of course, is that what happens is that that is the ability to look at oneself you know, doing these things almost in a photograph. And I really enjoyed that aspect of being around what were all very expensive musical instruments. I think I was probably the only person without an instrument there. But I don't think that that stopped, it did stop me from learning something from it. Um, so I guess picking up on um, what Simon was just saying, um, I, the benefit of running these workshops um, in, in a kind of participatory way of course is that it very clearly i felt uh through doing them it very clearly affords a different kind of access to knowledge than you might have from a kind of lecture-based um situation and i felt that having personally uh, to run these workshops i felt that having the guest um co-leader of the workshop was really important in terms of facilitating that kind of conversational flow of work and inviting people to contribute um, and so that was something I felt was one of the strongest experiences. Um, and certainly um, some very memorable conversations took place after we actually sat down and started to play. So um, from the topic that I was working, um, dealing with listening relationally in a kind of pitch oriented tuning space, what we might call, um, Having, having a kind of level of experience on a particular instrument, as Simon was saying, was not at all important because what was actually important was a passing back and forth of these sounds in a listening space, which we could call a tuning space or we could just call a listening sharing space. So I felt that having the co-presenter there um, in my partner, Bevan Flanagan, who co-presented the workshop with me, was very beneficial. So I could sort of pass a question to him and then the space became conversational. So that was one of the strongest things I took from it. Um, Pete, maybe do you want to pick up from there? Yeah. Um, I also thought that, uh, found that having the co, the guest co-leader was really useful um, in the workshop that um, I took part in and, and, and it, that I facilitated. Uh, we used a specific technological approach uh, with examples that uh, Rodrigo Constanzo brought with him um, during the workshop, which added towards a kind of more general overview of working across different technologies. Um, in some cases, you know, technology of the 19th century, like clarinet, uh, with technology of 21st century, or technology of, if you like, uh, music or the human body as a kind of technology, with uh, with uh, different assemblages of of um, uh, technical apparatus, if you like, including the digital. I felt that um, that worked really well in terms of having a general overview of. Um, performative priorities with specific technologies with which to work and examples people play with. Uh, so that kind of made for a conversation as well, rather than a kind of presentation and then take part. The fact of having a co-leader um, enabled the, the discussions in the session to immediately be more of a conversation rather than uh, following a kind of listen and learn and then try out model. Um, I did find that my experience was that time, and so we probably come back to this a few times, but time was rather short in terms of one afternoon to achieve anything more than um, some cursory first experiences of experimenting in performance. Um, but it stimulated a good deal of, uh, you know, initial creative work and discussion. Uh, and so was, I think, you know, certainly from the feedback valued by the participants. Thank you. So, um, well, I think that moves us um, on to the second question then um, in terms of what you think is valuable about focusing on embodiment um, in this kind of setting as opposed to thinking about technique or 
uh, musical outcome. And um, you've all touched on that a little bit already, um, but I'd just invite you to say a bit more about that. And again, um, if we go to Simon first. Sure. <clears throat> I mean, every time I see uh, something which says uh, the main focus isn't on technique, I I heave a sigh of relief in a sense. Um, and this is one of those areas which I think is re really important because um, observing various disciplines as, I, as, as one does in an interdisciplinary sort of way, um, there, there's, there is a language of acceptability and clearly in music there is an expectation that one composes or, or plays something or, or some variation on those sort of things. Um, but um, I, I'm very interested in the, in the notions about as it were, what all human beings, not just trained human beings, are capable of doing in any discipline. And the same sort of thing is true of music. So once you're, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, the exercise, one of the exercises which we did, um, where I was able to use my voice to uh, uh, conduct the exercise, um, that was a very powerful lesson for someone not trained in technique to be engaged in something which was like a sort of pan-human instrument that we created. So that's a really, really interesting, and it made a great impact on me, the notion that somehow, you know, out of nothing we created something, and also even most amazing uh, was that out of this, we all came to a point where we finished at the same point for reasons that didn't seem explicable. I would say though that, that if you come to this as someone who, uh, is not a, a, a natural performer, if you like, that there are going to be certain times when you when you sit back and take it as a lecture. And I found myself doing that at various sorts of stages. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing because I, I feel it sort of put, it pushed me to swap roles, if you like. Um, so there are, there are certain elements of, of doing things where you see someone, for example, uh, with a clarinet or a violin, <laughs> uh, where you know that there are things that you can't do. So certain bits of that which are, which are, are being discussed are really interesting, like the exact uh, finessing of pitching. Um, but when I see somebody appear with a snare drum and a comb and, um, and, a, and a PlayStation controller, I sort of think this is something where I can sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm stopping um, um, uh, listening uh, 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 to, to, to someone explaining something and I'm, very highly motivated to get engaged in some way. So there's something about that, I think in this, where the, there are certain types of activities which are more accessible, were more accessible to people like me. And the differences between the two, I thought were uh, re really uh, interesting. My, my regret is, if, if you like, that I felt that I wasn't engaged enough reflectively whilst I was doing it, um, which I've mentioned before. Okay. Yeah, so um, to, to follow on from that, um, my perspective uh, would just differ slightly from how this question is worded because I would say that uh, a focus on embodiment is for me a focus on technique, um, whereas um, these two things would offer a substantially different experience from say a ben uh, the benefits of a focus toward outcome so just to elaborate on that a little bit um this is, would be kind of an epistemic perspective on technique as articulated by um the theater practitioner ben spatz um in 2015 book what a body can do um which sees technique as the body's knowledge or knowledge held by a lived body uh, rather than a kind of um more traditionally musical way of viewing techniques, which might be more like something like a toolkit or a set of skills that are measurable or classifiable by external metric of some kind that we can use. So technique here wouldn't be considered something that can be conditioned, but technique is knowledge that can be grown. So I find this um, to hold really clear, really obvious benefits um, for a kind of workshop scenario like this, and certainly for a uh, kind of performance pedagogy and performance uh, practice research more broadly because, um, well, firstly, it opens all stages of a practice process to evaluation in terms of its knowledge objects. So not just um, a publicly presented, what might be considered finished uh, version of a performance practice, but all stages of that process. Um, and also in that it's inclusive of let more uh, varied kinds of practices 
and also to practitioners at all stages of proficiency or development or familiarity with that practice. So um, to say that maybe more simply, um, any person uh, coming to a practice, whether it's in the first encounter with that practice or whether it's something, as Simon has, has said, in which someone is highly trained, um, valid and valuable knowledge objects can emerge from that experience if you take the view that technique is knowledge. So, uh, yeah, Pete, maybe do you want to pick up there? I agree with, with, with that uh, position, um, and I think that's really important to bring up. There tends, uh, in this kind of work in the area that we were looking at, to be a focus on technology and, and its processes in human computer music, for example, um, improvisation systems that are built uh, tend to focus on that, um, those processes, those logical processes that are in place in terms of, for example, the programming code or the, or the, the you know, the, the, the type of responses that are being designed. So it's a kind of interaction design led um, and, and kind of coding led approach. Bringing an embodied focus really helps to uh, situate the work more firmly in the context of experience, which I think uh, you know was the was the primary focus of the of the project overall. So that that really helped. I feel that this kind of more phenomenological autoethnographic approach served to frame this kind of work with human technical assemblages in terms of an overall instrumentality um, with, uh, with a focus on, on performance and its experience, the experience of the experimentation um, as an outcome, these kind of uh, the, the exploration of creativity and the inaction of, of the performative experience was put at the center um, of the uh, of the of the um, of the workshops. Thank you, and I think this uh, explanation of how the encounter with sort of technique, technology, performance is is redefined through embodiment uh, in these ways. I think is a really um, important observation, and so maybe also um, leads directly into this question about um, what what guidance do you think uh, people need in order to to work in this way. Um, Simon, I know that you've already mentioned some of the things that you would advise your, your past self uh, now, but um, maybe again, if we can start with you and, and, and you can uh, pass on some of your um, further thoughts about that, that would 